Hey everyone, I am Miss Hu, your physics teacher. In this video, we will be going through circular motion and centripetal force. So what we'll be covering in this lesson are what causes circular motion, the forces acting on an object in circular motion, as well as the factors which affect circular motion. So first of all, let's learn what causes circular motion. Now, one thing you must understand about motion is that when an object is moving, the direction of the object is always linear. So it's always either just forward or backward, or if it's moving side to side, it's always in a linear fashion. Circular is not a direction. So you cannot be saying that, oh, the direction of the object is circular. So an object can move in a circular fashion, but the direction is constantly changing throughout that circular motion. So let's understand what causes circular motion. Say we've got a car that's moving forward due to the engine thrust. So this blue arrow I'm drawing here represents the thrust of the engine. If you're driving a car, even if you're not holding a steering wheel, you'll find that the car just tends to move straight forward if there are no other forces acting on the car. But if you wanted to make a turn, then of course you'll have to turn the steering wheel. Either you turn it to the right or you turn it to the left. So when you turn the steering wheel, what's happening is you're applying a force that will translate to the force on the wheels. So for example, in this case, there could be a force that pushes the car this way, and that actually creates friction between the wheels and the road. Now, you can see that these two forces act in such a way that it creates a resultant force in between that causes the car to move and change direction like so. So when you have an overall object that's moving in a circular manner like this, what happens is actually there is a constant application of forces that makes the object change direction throughout the entire circular path. So for example, if the ball is here, the ball is actually traveling like that, and there is an inward force making the ball change direction constantly. So when the ball is moving along the circular path, it is constantly changing directions. However, if you want to understand the entire circular motion, we have to know what are the forces that are causing the object to move along the circular path. So this is where we need to learn about centripetal force. So centripetal force is the force that acts inwards towards the center of the circular path from the object. So what I'm labeling F here, that's the centripetal force. Now, let's look at the motion of the object. Say it's moving at a constant speed throughout the entire motion. Does that mean that the object is moving with constant velocity? Again, my question is, the object is moving with constant speed throughout the entire motion. Does that mean it's moving with constant velocity? If you can remember what you've learned about velocity, then you would know that the answer is no. Velocity is speed with direction. The direction is constantly changing throughout the circular motion. That means that the velocity is constantly changing. When the velocity changes, that means there's acceleration. So in this case, that means that this entire circular motion has acceleration. Because of the way the object is moving, the acceleration is also inwards following the direction of the force. Because of the way the object is moving, you'll have to be aware that the overall resultant force of the circular motion is the centripetal force. So if you ever come across a question that asks you to determine the resultant force of this circular motion, the resultant force is actually the centripetal force and the direction is inwards towards the center of the circle. So for example, if the ball is on this side, like so, okay, that's supposed to be the tennis ball, the centripetal force 
is acting from the object towards the center of the circle. So this is the centripetal force, which is the resultant force of the entire motion. So if you'd like to understand why is it that the resultant force is towards the center of the circle, it's because of the entire motion. The centripetal force is what is keeping the object moving in that circular fashion. So that's why the resultant force is the centripetal force for circular motion. Now, any time an object is moving in a circular fashion, there is always centripetal force. And sometimes the centripetal force could appear as different kinds of forces in different situations. So, for example, if you have an object like this where you have a ball tied to a string and you spin it round, like say for example we have this case. I don't have a ball but I've got a key and I'm spinning it round. So this string is what's keeping the key in a circular fashion. And when you think about the string, there's actually tension. So that means in the case of an object that's spinning around in a circle on a string, there's actually tension. Which in this case is also the centripetal force. That means in this situation, the centripetal force is also the tension acting along the string in this situation. Now, what else do we know that's also moving in a circular fashion? Yes, orbits. So for example, the planets orbiting the sun, the moon orbiting the planets, or a satellite orbiting the planets. What's keeping those orbiting objects in orbit? The gravitational force, right? So in this case, the gravitational force is the centripetal forces in this case. And for a car that's moving around a circular path, what's keeping that car moving along the circular path? It is the application of the friction of the wheels on the road when the driver is turning the steering wheel. This is the friction. So what I'm showing you here on the slides is just to point out to you that in different situations of circular paths, the centripetal forces are equal to other forces that are acting in a situation. So the term centripetal force here just means the force that's acting towards the center of the circular path. And depending on the situation, the centripetal force can appear as different types of forces. So it could be tension, it could be gravitational force, it could be friction, or it could be any other force depending on that situation. So the centripetal force is not a type of force all on its own. It's basically the name given to the force that is acting in a circular path. So think of centripetal force. No, this is not an example of a specific type of force. It's just the name of the force based on its direction, which is towards the center of the circular path. Now, a common question you could come across is what happens when the centripetal force is removed? So which means, for example, if you were to be spinning an object on a string and you suddenly let go, that means there's no more tension force. Or if you cut the string, or perhaps an orbiting object, suddenly there's no more gravitational force. Or maybe if you're driving on a circular path, you no longer turn the car. So you can try this at home as well. Just get an object which you tie on a string. So I've got a key here and you spin it. And then you let go and see where it goes. Now, most people think that when the object spins, it will continue to fly in a circular direction. No, it will fly off in a straight line. So what straight line are we referring to? It is the tangent to the point where the object suddenly leaves a circle, the point where that centripetal force no longer exists. So if in this case, this is the point where the centripetal force suddenly is removed, that means we cut the string at this point, then the object will fly off at a tangent. So say for example, this object was initially moving in a clockwise fashion. Now it will move in a direction that is tangent to that point on the circle. And if you want to understand why, let's recall what we've learned from an earlier slide. We know that there are two forces causing the object to change direction. 
the forward force as well as the centripetal force. So obviously, if the centripetal force is no longer there, there is still that forward force. That forward force will cause the object to move in that linear fashion. So remember earlier I mentioned that when an object moves, its direction is always linear. So if one force has been removed, there's only one force that's still acting on the object. It will move in the direction of that force. So that's why if a driver is driving a car and they no longer turn and just let the steering wheel shift back, it moves in a straight line. So you also see this in sports games when someone is throwing the discus. They hold the discus and they turn round and round and round and then when they let go, you find that discus travels in a straight line. It doesn't move in a circle. So remember that the object moves in a straight line that is tangent to the point where it has left the circle. Obviously, the direction follows its initial direction. If it was moving clockwise, then it's got to move there. If it's going the other way, if it's anti-clockwise, obviously it moves downwards. Now, how to calculate centripetal force? There is an equation for centripetal force. The formula to calculate centripetal force is F equals mv squared over r, where F is the centripetal force. And because it's a force, the unit for force is, that's right, Newton. So this would be expressed in Newton. M is the mass of the spinning object. And if you want to express force in Newton, then you must use the SI units in the equations, which means that mass is in kilograms. V is the speed at which the object is moving in. So, so this centripetal force can only be calculated when the speed is uniform. And obviously when we're spinning an object, we want it to spin at a constant speed. If you're trying to change the speed, then obviously the force will be changing all the time as well. It's kind of weird. So the speed is of course expressed in meters per second. So we don't say velocity in this case because remember, the velocity is constantly changing. The magnitude of the velocity could be the same because it's moving at constant speed, but the direction is constantly changing. So to make it easier for us to express this equation correctly, mathematically, let's just use the term speed instead of velocity. R is the radius of that circular path. That means that if you measure from the circular path to the center, that would be the radius in this case. And of course, radius must be measured in meters, which is the SI unit. So this is the equation for the centripetal force. Now, what if you were asked to calculate the acceleration of the motion? It's really quite simple. All we need to do is just compare this formula to the F equals MA formula, which is from Newton's second law of motion. I'm going to write that on the side here. Now you can see from these two equations that you've got F and F, M and M. So A is whatever is left behind in the equation. So to calculate A, it's quite simply V squared over R, where V is the speed and R is the radius. In case you're wondering, do the units actually match up in this case? You can do a quick check. You know that speed is meters per second, and because it's squared, that means this is meters squared per second squared, and R is meters. So basically, you would get meters per second squared divided by meters, cut, cut, you would get meters per second squared, which is the unit for acceleration. So yes, this all matches up. Now, if you're taking SPM, you do need to know how to use the centripetal force equations, but if you're taking IGCSE, Actually, you don't. So for IGCSE, you just need to focus on the factors affecting the centripetal force. Although you don't need to know the formula, it kind of helps in understanding how the factors affect the centripetal force. I'm going to rewrite the formula here, F equals mv squared over r. By using the formula, it makes it very easy for us to determine what the factors are and how the factors affect the centripetal force. You can see that the only factors you need to know are mass, speed, and radius, and these are all present in the equation. So when it comes to physical quantities where you can calculate, normally the factors are basically in the equation itself because when you change one value, it changes the dependent variable. So from the equation, you can see that 
mass and force are directly proportional. So to make this slide really simple, I'm just going to write in short form. M here is mass. So when the mass increases, the arrow here means increasing, the centripetal force, which is F, increases. So that's what this short form here means. When mass increases, centripetal force increases. Now let's look at speed. You can see that the speed speed is on the top of the fraction. So an increase in the speed will cause an increase in the centripetal force. So I'm going to write here, when V increases, F also increases. Whereas for the radius, you can see that it's on the opposite side of the fraction. So an increase in the radius would cause a decrease in the centripetal force. A higher number at the denominator of the fraction will cause the final answer to be lower. Now for IGCSE, you just need to know these general relationships. You don't actually need to know whether it's already proportional or that oh, it's already proportional to a squared value. You don't have to know about that. You just need to know in general. Now all of these changes are assuming that other factors are constant. For example, an increase in mass will only cause an increase in force if the speed and radius are still constant. The same thing goes for the others as well. An increase in speed will cause an increase in the centripetal force if the mass and radius are constant and an increase in the radius will cause a decrease in the centripetal force if the mass and speed are constant. Every time we're investigating how the factors affect the dependent variable, all other factors must remain constant. Now, in case you're wondering, are these relationships actually true? You can actually try this at home. Just get a piece of string and some objects and try tying it and spinning it. It's about how much force you need to apply to keep the object spinning at that particular speed. So if you change the mass, try first with a lower mass object and then a higher mass object, keeping the radius the same, see which one requires more force to be able to spin at the same speeds. And then for the same mass of the object and the same radius, try slow speed and higher speed, which one requires more force to keep the object moving. And then same thing for the radius, try with a small radius, and then try for a larger radius, which one requires more force to be able to keep spinning at the same speed. So this is something you can actually do just to test out whether these factors are actually true, and that way you'll be able to remember the factors more correctly, in addition, of course, to knowing the formula. And that is it for this video. So if you found this video to be educational and helpful, please click like and subscribe for more free physics lessons. Do check out my YouTube channel for videos on other topics you might find helpful. If you would like to help me keep making free educational video lessons and lab practicals, donations are welcomed at my coffee page. That's ko-fi.com slash physicsrocks. If you'd like access to notes, quizzes, and syllabus updates, check out my website at physicsrocks.com. Happy studying!